Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. We're back. Oh, this is great to um, see so many of you here this morning. I want to welcome you uh, to this um, time of centering and worship. And I want to extend just such a gracious welcome to everyone who is joining us on Zoom this morning. We are living in a new world because of COVID. And one of the realities is that we are now meeting in person and on Zoom. So here we are, this unified body of Christ, come together, putting aside what we've been carrying this past week and offering ourselves in praise and thanksgiving to God. So I am so very glad you're here. If you haven't heard, we will be hosting our annual meeting following worship this morning. And for those of you on Zoom, um, we encourage you to stay on. You get a sense of where we are headed with respect to the year 2022. Are there any announcements before we begin our worship this morning? It is mask optional. So some of you have chosen to wear masks. Some of you uh, don't have masks. And we just learned very recently that the transmission rate in Montgomery County right now, which is where we are, is rather low. So we thank God that this COVID um, chapter, we hope, has come to an end. <laughs> Having said that, I'm going to ask you to center as we begin our morning worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
You may be seated. I'd like to invite you in joining me as we offer our centering prayer. Gracious God of all creation, we open our hearts to you on this Sabbath day when rest, reflection, and renewal seek a centering place in our lives. Still our hearts are rendered with grief, anxiety, and worry as the world around us continues to experience violence, disorientation, and pain. Holy God, may our worship be that journey back to our sacred center, the place in which we can hear your still small voice of calm and reassurance. We ask that your word and light fill our beings so that we might be the hands and hearts of your divine presence everywhere in the world you so love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us that everyone is our neighbor. Amen. So we have some children here this morning, and uh, I have a little message for them. If they would like to come down, um, I'll wear my mask. And I think, oh yeah, yep, this is good. Come on down, Grace. You can come on up and you can sit right here on the steps. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Good morning. I want you to know that I have really missed you, seeing you in person. And I'm so glad you're here today. I have a picture that I want you to help me with. Can you tell me what is in this picture? Grace? There's a donkey and two people. What can you tell me about those people? He's helping the man who's on the donkey. What do you think happened to that man on the donkey? He got hurt. He got hurt. So we have a man, and he, and he stops and puts this other man on his donkey because the man is hurt. Now I want to tell you something. There were other people who saw this man hurt, but they didn't stop. I wonder why they didn't stop. don't know. Yeah, Grace. Yes, they didn't know what to do. That's a really, really good answer. Sometimes when people get hurt, we don't know what to do, do we? We just don't. And yet this man here in the picture, he sort of knew what to do. He put that other man on his donkey, and you know where he took him? He took him to a hotel where the person who owned the hotel could, could help him. We call this man in the picture the Good Samaritan. Did you ever hear that word before, Samaritan? We use it a lot, a Good Samaritan is a person who helps someone else. Do you think God wants us to help other people? Yeah. Especially, even if we don't know how, we can at least try. 
right? Yeah. So I want you to remember the Good Samaritan. It's a story that's in the Bible. And it's a story that's, that's really important for us to understand. So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank You for this day. And we thank You for the gift of caring. Amen. Well, thanks so much for coming up. You can go back to your families now. Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise, and gave him a big thumbs up. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So weeks ago, when I chose the story of the Good Samaritan for today's scripture focus, I had no idea the world would be laser focused on the war in Ukraine. It appears that when Vladimir Putin's army entered Ukraine on February 24th, he thought the citizens of Ukraine would simply move aside, allowing him to topple the existing government and install his own. Putin, however, has made a huge miscalculation. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky shocked Mr. Putin, and in fact has shocked the world by rallying solidarity throughout his country in an all-out resistance that has captured the world's attention. The Ukrainian resistance since February 24th has been nothing short of miraculous. As one person in a letter to the editor of the New York Times wrote, and I quote, I thought I knew what bravery was, and then I saw Ukraine. Given the resistance, 
and probably coupled with the need to save face and avoid embarrassment, Mr. Putin has now escalated the bombing, the terror, and the assault on Ukraine, disregarding the principles of the United Nations and breaking international law, committing crimes of aggression. He's doubling down on Ukraine and lashing out. Mr. Putin has threatened the use of nuclear weapons. He has also intentionally attacked Europe's largest nuclear power plant located in Ukraine. And in the meantime, the 30 NATO nations have been put on high alert and are supplying Ukraine with anti-tank missiles, guns, and ammunition, and very recently has agreed to supply planes. It looks as if Mr. Putin's objective is to beat Ukraine into submission. There's also evidence that the invading Russian force under Putin is employing cluster and vacuum bombs, affecting innocent civilians where there are no military targets. This constitutes a war crime, and there have been several calls for the International Criminal Court to investigate. Mr. Putin has suddenly become an international pariah, and the people of Russia will suffer due to his unbridled and destructive aggression. No one and no area in Ukraine appears to be off limits with respect to Mr. Putin's violent incursion. Refugees are fleeing by the tens of thousands to places like Poland, where they are provided safe haven. All last week, as I was absorbing this shock, this horror, and this unfolding before me in Ukraine, I was also mindful of the parable we refer to as the Good Samaritan. It may be one of the most recognized stories in all of Scripture. Luke tells us that a man, we have no information about his identity, was traveling down a notoriously dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And apparently, this road contained narrow passes, easy places for robbers to hide. The man was assaulted. He was robbed. He was beaten and left for dead. Two men, first a priest, and then a Levite, a temple functionary, on separate occasions discovered this man by the side of the road and probably assumed he was dead. And each, the priest and the Levite, stepped to the other side of the road most likely to avoid contamination from a corpse, which was part of their religious obligation. That priest and that Levite were following tradition. They were adhering to their norms, 
adhering to the boundaries. And as you and I encounter this story, we want the priest and the Levite to break the tradition. Forget the danger. And just help. Just do something. I've thought about the nation of Ukraine as that man who was robbed and beaten in Luke's parable. I've thought about President Volodymyr Zelensky pleading with NATO to employ a so-called no-fly zone over Ukraine, denying airspace to Russian planes. Why can't you just break the norm, break the boundary, and help us, pleads Zelensky. That would probably cause a very accelerated escalation, say NATO officials, and even possibly invoking World War III because NATO planes would have to guard that airspace, and Mr. Putin seems to be in no mood to back down. More people would end up wounded, dying, and suffering. Of course, you and I don't know if anyone witnessed the priest or the Levite walking right by that man who was beaten and then robbed. And I've often wondered if that priest or Levite could have done anything had they come upon the robbers in the act of that aggression. That priest that Levite probably would have been outnumbered by the robbers. Would they have been willing to risk getting involved? Because of today's high level of sophistication in technology, the whole world can witness the war in Ukraine on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in real time. We can all see what's going on. And folks have tried to register their anger at President Putin and Russia by doing everything from pouring Russian vodka down the drain to targeting Russian restaurants here in the United States by vandals. Right now, you and I can feel helpless as Ukrainians fight for their lives and for their freedom. Right now, you and I are witnessing in real time a moral atrocity. And we want to do something. Humanitarian efforts will need all the support they can get. And I am convinced, I am certain that this congregation, in joining with thousands of congregations throughout the world, will respond as quickly as we can. In fact, during our annual meeting this morning, following worship, our consistory will be making some very solid proposals in helping to deliver aid to Ukraine and to Ukrainian refugees. In addition to providing humanitarian help, there is something else we can do. One of the great theologians of the 20th century, a man by the name of Karl Barth, 
was instrumental in the formation of what was called the Confessing Church in Germany. This Confessing Church stood up and defied Hitler and the Nazi regime. Here is what Karl Barth wrote. To clasp hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Heaven knows the world is in deep disorder right now. And I'm asking you to be vigilant in praying for the people of Ukraine. Pray, I ask you, for the leaders, world leaders, as they continue to sanction, condemn, strategize, provide aid, and stem the violence in Ukraine. This I know. It takes enormous courage. It takes enormous courage to be a good Samaritan. Samaritans were by and large hated by Jews and vice versa. And yet, by all accounts, it was a Samaritan who crossed the biggest boundary of all, the boundary of hate, to give aid to a dying man at the side of the road. The lawyer who engaged Jesus in this parable wanted to know the path towards inheriting eternal life. And what we discover through this story of the Good Samaritan is that eternal life isn't so much a focus on believing the right things as it is in doing the right things. Courageous things. Things right here and right now. The great early church theologian Augustine interpreted this parable of the Good Samaritan as allegory. Jesus, he believed, was the Good Samaritan. The ultimate outsider when it came to the religious establishment, Jesus came to the aid of the one who was wounded, broken, and hurting. And Augustine asserted that in some respects, we are all that man by the side of the road. Augustine went on to say that the church represented the inn, the inn where the wounded man was taken, the place in which that robbed and wounded and neglected soul could be held and nourished until he was strong enough to return to daily life. Right now, the church has the opportunity to become the inn for Ukrainian refugees. Who was the true neighbor? Jesus asked the lawyer after sharing the parable of the Good Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy, responded the lawyer. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Amen.
just to remind you that our offering is the way in which we express mercy and kindness and love. I'm going to ask each and every one of you to be prepared next Sunday to bring an additional offering for the people of Ukraine. And I want to thank you so much for your prayers and for your concern and for your vigilance in holding the people of Ukraine in your hearts. You can drop today's offering off on your way out. We have some baskets at the rear of the sanctuary. And may God bless you. Amen.
I want to thank our bell choir this morning. It's a very, uh, a very healing moment for me to be caught up in that music. And to be reminded of God's faithfulness. I also want to welcome the members and friends of BAME's United Church of Christ. Those members and friends at BAME's join us the first Sunday of each month as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I want to thank everyone who is here today and everyone who is on Zoom. During our Thursday night book study, we talked about Jesus as friend. It's one of the chapters in Diana Butler Bass's book titled Freeing Jesus. She focuses on these six aspects of Jesus. And one of them is friend. And as I stand here this morning before you, I'm realizing that you are my friends. You are my friends. Because Jesus brought us together as friends. In the same way Jesus brought together His friends around an ordinary table. Yes, it's a table of friendship. But it is also a table of declaration. Of God's unstoppable love. Even in the face of tragedy and evil. And so we are reminded of these words. That on the night of his betrayal and desertion. Jesus took bread. And after he had given God thanks, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body. Broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup and again gave God thanks. Saying, this is the blood of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul tells us as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we tell of the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. O gracious and holy God, your presence resounds throughout the world. It is everywhere in the universe. And it is also in a very particular way in this bread and cup. Reminders of your nourishment and your embrace and your love. So we ask you to bless our world and to bless these gifts of bread and cup. As we continue to become friends to the world in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
the body of Christ broken for you. the cup of blessing for you and for the world. Let us pray. O gracious God, we give you thanks for welcoming us to this table. No restrictions. We give you thanks for your embrace, for your welcome, for your declaration that we are friends to each other and to a hurting world. O oh God, on this Sunday morning, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray as we know that they are afraid that they've endured shelling, wounds, threats, bombs, terror. O oh God, we pray for peace. We pray that Your Spirit might somehow bring comfort and bring ease to all who are hurting everywhere. God, we give You thanks this morning that You are courageous enough to entrust the promises of Your Gospel to us. That You've called us to be witnesses, to be models, to be present, to love. To care. God, remind us this week of all the little things that we can do to offer hospitality and kindness. To offer a smile and an embrace. And to offer ourselves as friends to a world that is so hurting and at times so angry. And at times so disruptive. And at times feeling so hopeless. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Our Lord. Who taught us to pray saying. Our Father. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It has been a blessing this morning to be with you. To be with companions. To be with those with whom we break bread and celebrate life. To be, as Jesus said, to be friends. And so now as we go each to our own neighborhoods, to our own workplaces, to our own families, know that God blesses you and keeps you. Know that God's face shines upon you and is gracious to you. And know that God gives you peace. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Following our postlude, I hope we'll have an opportunity to say goodbye to our friends on Zoom. So following the postlude, I'll ask you to turn around. There's a camera in the back. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do the, do the Wences wave. <laughs> God bless.